Yesterday we began the week of prayer for Christian unity. All throughout the New Testament we see that unity is the highest value for Christians. In fact, I would say, and I often do tell my students, that division is the most serious sin in the church. The source of Christian unity is baptism. If we look carefully at the book of Acts, the history of the early mission of the church, we see that the church first baptized people in the name of the Lord Jesus. But by the time the Gospel of Matthew is written down, maybe 50 to 60 years later, we see already the developing practice of baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now, any baptism using water and the Trinitarian formula is a valid baptism. So a person baptized in this way does not have to receive baptism again, no matter what Christian group he or she joins. So if someone is a Presbyterian and they go through RCIA and they join Church of the Holy Spirit and they become a Catholic, their baptism is valid. They're not rebaptized. If a person is a Catholic and becomes a Methodist, their baptism is valid and they are not rebaptized. We are united as Christians in the sacrament of baptism. And there are these three things that happen in baptism that unite all Christians. First of all, we receive forgiveness for our sins. We receive healing. We are baptized with water. Water is the symbol of the removal of God's judgment. The water which symbolized judgment in the Old Testament, like in the water of the flood, becomes the symbol of the removal of sin. We are baptized into the same baptism that Jesus received. So Jesus' baptism is the symbol of his uniting himself with us in our condition of sin. And not only are we forgiven, but because of this, we are given the great comfort that Jesus has united himself with us in all of our personal struggles. So Jesus walks with us. Jesus is aware that even though we're forgiven from our sins, it's probably going to take us a while to synthesize and assimilate the whole gospel and we'll probably end up committing mistakes along the way. So Jesus walks with us and there's nothing really that's ultimately going to be too difficult for us to overcome because Jesus has placed himself in solidarity with us in the condition of sin itself. Second, we receive in baptism the power of new life. And you have to look really carefully at this reading from the Gospel of John. Um, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin <coughs> of the world. Not the sins of the world. The sin of the world. You know, why does it say that? It says that because Jesus is not just going to forgive us our individual <coughs> sins. But Jesus comes to take away the condition of sin itself he comes to take away the sin of the world so we are also baptized with the holy spirit we are born again we're given the possibility to start over in the catholic rite of baptism we're anointed with chrism the symbolism of the chrism is it makes your face shine with the joy of new life and we're given a candle which signifies the enlightenment of our minds by the wisdom of Christ. This is new life. Not just forgiveness of mistakes, but renewal, transformation. So the first letter of John goes so far as to say, no one who is born of water and the Spirit continues to sin. So there's no reason why any Christian has to sin. The only reason we sin is because we haven't assimilated the whole truth of the Gospel yet. And finally, in baptism, we become members of the covenant people called to mission. In the Catholic rite of baptism, this is symbolized by the epitha rite. So the priest or deacon places his hands over the ears and mouth of the baptized person and prays that he or she will become a hearer of the word and a speaker of the word. In other words, that they will become a missionary of Jesus Christ. I'm encouraging all of you all to read Pope's new document on mission and joy of the gospel. I'm sure
sure you're all eagerly logging onto the computer and poring over this document in your spare time, which is what we should be doing. Now in chapter four of the joy of the gospel, Francis talks about the social dimension of the gospel, and he focuses on two things. One, the inclusion of the poor in society, and two, dialogue as the foundation for peace. And he says the Catholic Church should be engaging in dialogue in four ways. We should be in dialogue with the state, we should be in dialogue with science, we should be in dialogue with other churches, ecumenical dialogue, and we should be in dialogue with other religions, in a religious dialogue. Listen to what he says about dialogue with other churches. He says, commitment to ecumenism responds to the prayer of the Lord Jesus that they may all be one, John 17, 21. The credibility of the Christian message would be much greater if Christians could overcome their divisions. We must never forget that we are pilgrims journeying alongside one another. This means that we must have sincere trust in our fellow pilgrims, putting aside all suspicion or mistrust, and turn our gaze to what we are all seeking, the radiant peace of God's face. This is very beautiful. So Francis reminds us that all Christians united in baptism are fellow pilgrims journeying together. And we are all seeking the three things that baptism initiates in our lives. Healing from the damage caused by negative ways of living, a new positive life lived in the wisdom we receive from Christ, and the fulfillment of our mission, peace on earth, a united humanity in which every person created in the image of God is fully realized. Everybody is seeking those three things. All Christians are seeking them. A number of years ago, N.C. Wright, who's a person I often uh, mention and whose books I recommend, the Anglican bishop and New Testament scholar, he came to the seminary where I teach, and I was able to interview him, and he made a commitment that always stayed with me. He said that the greatest need in the 21st century is for Christians to come together in common witness to the love of Christ. He said the question for the 21st century is not how many members each Christian group will gain or lose. The question for the 21st century is whether anyone will be Christian at all by the end of this century. And so Christians must come together in common witness to Christ. The great evangelical Protestant scholar of mission, Leslie Newbigin, wrote a book 20 years ago called Can the West Be Converted? He's asking, is it even possible for Europe and the United States to, to be Christian anymore? Can we have any hope that the United States and Europe will be Christian by the end of this millennium? And he said, there's one major change that he thought has to happen if this hope is to be realized. And he said that change is to overcome the privatization of religion, our tendency to make our religious faith a private matter. Sometimes something that we're almost ashamed of. How many of you are proud to say, I go to church every Sunday, if you were out in a bar drinking with people? <laughs> I'm not kidding, if you were out in a bar drinking with people, and they said, oh, what are you gonna do this weekend? Did you say, like, I'm going to church? <laughs> a lot of people don't. I mean, they say, oh, I don't know, I'm going to watch the game. Or blah, 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 you know. but, this, but they don't want to say I'm a Christian. They don't want to say I'm going to church. But we need to share our faith with our family and friends. We need to live our faith publicly. Leslie Newman says, our faith cannot be lived within the enclave, in that corner of the private sector which our culture labels religion, but rather in the public sector where God's will, as declared in Jesus Christ, is either done or not done in the daily business of nations and societies, in the councils of governments, the boardrooms of corporations, the universities and schools. During this celebration of Christian unity, we're also called to think about how we are journeying with the fellow pilgrims in our own families. Some members of our families may have left the Catholic Church for various reasons. They are continuing their journey in other ways. And our response must be to continue to journey 
with them, not to look at them as traitors and not to make them feel uncomfortable. So the Pope is calling us all to continue in dialogue about the things that we all want, the things that unite us about healing, about new life, about peace. Pope John XXIII published his first encyclical in June 1959, and as he reflected on his decision to call the Second Vatican Council, he focused that whole encyclical on <coughs> unity and peace. And he quoted the well-known Latin saying, in necessaris unitas, in dubis libertas, in omnibus caritas. In necessary things, unity. In doubtful things, liberty. In all things, charity. So in this week of Christian unity, we ask the Lord to help us to live this truth together with all of our Christian sisters and brothers. In necessary things, unity. In doubtful things, liberty. In all things, charity.